to the Freedom from the Struggle podcast. Here are your hosts, Anthony and Melissa. Well, hello, everybody. We are so glad that you are here with us on the Freedom from the Struggle podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Corelli. I'm your host, Melissa. Welcome back to season three. Yeah, we are so glad to have everybody here. As uh, Melissa said, this is uh, episode one of season three. We have a great season planned up for you ahead in the next coming weeks, uh, starting out with tonight's episode, which is going to be one that I think speaks volumes to a lot of different groups of people, as well as, you know, tells some stories of not only the paranormal, but of some spiritual abuse as well. Mm -hmm. And it is a very, I would say, heart-wrenching and eye-opening letter. So we look forward to getting to that. I just wanted to give you some information about the podcast. If you have stumbled upon us, if you're new, you haven't listened before, let's kind of tell you what we do here at the Freedom From The Struggle podcast. Um, I would say that the best way to classify this podcast is to say that it is a Christian paranormal podcast. And a lot of people don't know what that term means. But in today's society, there's a lot of emphasis on the paranormal, a lot of, you know, kind of intrigue, I guess, about the occult and things uh, spooky, if you will. And so this podcast uh, entertains a lot of those subjects but we do approach it from a Christian perspective and a Christian worldview here. What we mainly do is try to help those who are struggling with spiritual warfare or demonic attack by just kind of listening to their stories and hearing them out and letting them be real and honest here. One thing that is very valuable uh, that we believe into somebody telling their story is that that person feels like that they're heard and that they're understood, mm -hmm. and that they're not judged. Exactly. And so that's yeah. very much what we do here. This podcast um, has set out to reach those who are struggling, but maybe don't know where to turn in terms of practical help when you are in the midst of the struggle of demonic attack. And what we mean by that is you can watch a million paranormal shows on the television, and they will come to your house, these ghost hunters, and they will seek out evidence and they will find some amazing things with all of this technology that's out there, mm -hmm. different cameras with different light spectrums and audio recording devices, etc. And yet their goal is to really capture the evidence and then drive away in their nice fancy vans, <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> what we do here is we try to help out those uh, to find relief from the struggle, if you will. So that's what we're about. I always encourage you, if you're wondering what our theology is or kind of how we approach this, what we truly believe here on this podcast, I would just tune you into season one of this podcast, which is a nine week series mm -hmm. that has a lot of practical teaching, a lot of controversial theology. One thing that I would say here that you probably need to understand is if you're scared to listen to this podcast because you're worried if we're religious freaks, uh, yes. I could tell you this, you will find nobody on mm -hmm. planet earth who hates religion more than me. I cannot stand it. I believe that religion itself is from the devil, but there is relief in the grace of God. And that's what we choose to kind of portray here as well as teach here, as well as guide people to. And you're going to see that throughout this episode tonight. Mm -hmm. But what we want to do first is kind of see how you went, how you were doing through the break, Melissa. I personally know that there was some <laughs> struggles of your own going on, but why don't you share with us how your break went and kind of what's going on in your life? Well, I had a really nice break, um, had some family changes. Um, my sister passed away a few weeks ago, so my dog and I took a road trip and he loves road trips, so we jumped in the car, um, nice scenery, um, spent some time with my family and my friends. Um, so just my sister passed away a few weeks ago. So just kind of dealing with that. But um, in the midst of all of that, um, on the road trip, I did listen to season one again, and like all your teaching and your um, theology. Uh, so it was really, really good. You did a great job on season one, you really host that one by yourself. 
And um, as I was listening to that, I was struggling, not struggling, but I was just asking God about like, what can I do to honor my sister? She was such a beautiful person. And so what my family and I came up with, and I just asked them about how they felt about this is to set up some type of foundation in the honor of her name um, to help families fly their family members home uh, because we had to experience that and just try to make that process as easy as possible and to help them financially you know with that part of it so my family and I agreed upon that so we're kind of in the works of how to set up a, a foundation and what the ins and outs of all of that and so I think our goal is for maybe the first year is to try to help at least five to 10 family members um, to just to pay, to help them with that process and the cost of that. And, but it was a great road trip, saw some childhood family. I mean, childhood friends I haven't seen since I was like 14. <clears throat> I'm in my fifties now. So, and they're like, Oh, you haven't changed. They're like, Oh, that's great. <laughs> but it was, a, it was, it was nice overall. Well, and, the- and we here, you know, I would say I'm speaking for the listeners right now probably find that very idea intriguing. And Mm -hmm. so as Melissa and her family members kind of continue to work on starting this foundation or this 501c3 or however they form it, I will continue to bring it to the podcast and maybe ask you listeners to help in any way you can, because it is very difficult when you know, as we get older, like Melissa said, when we're in our fifties, our families tend to be scattered Mm -hmm. all over. And yet we don't really think about it or we don't really plan on what we would do if somebody did pass away and where they would want to be buried and where the family would want to have services. So that is kind of one of those unforeseen expenses. Mm -hmm. You know, we could even plan a will and, and, and have our life completely planned out in terms of, you know, the end of our life. Yet that's one thing that I think a lot of people don't consider let's say even somebody who was on a trip. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't mean Exa- they're necessarily yeah. moved mm-hmm. across the, the country. It could be that they were visiting somewhere and then this happened. So I think it's a great idea. I think, um, you know, the Bible kind of alludes to the fact that there's beauty from ashes. And so yeah, from exactly. this horrible situation that happened in your family, your siblings have prayed and put their minds to it and have found a way to maybe bless others. So we will definitely look forward to hearing more about that as that evolves. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Now, what I want to do is get right to this letter um, because I think it's one that's going to open some eyes and definitely make us wonder what is going on with the church. Now, I already had this kind of planned ahead, so I would imagine that from some of our marketing that we're doing for season three, some of you have stumbled upon this podcast for the first time. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm somebody who hates religion and I'm also not a hypocrite. I think what you'll find with me is I am somebody who has found the ability to be honest and transparent because as a minister for all of those years, I think I spent a, a, a decent majority of the beginning years being that same kind of judgmental above everybody type Christian, even though I was trying not to be, (laughs) because I think there's a natural thing that happens within Christianity where we become in the belief that we're somehow farther along or better than other Mm -hmm. people who are struggling. So we start to call out sin and, and look down our noses at people. And then you know, through a series of my own screw ups and some eye opening experiences, I realized that that's a bunch of nonsense. Really. Mm -hmm. We are all in this fight together. And when I hear stories like the one we're about to read from a gentleman named Kurt, I think of how spiritual abuse is such a, it's such a horrible part of Christianity itself. And it can bring on so many unforeseen things as you will find out in this letter as well. So if you stumbled upon this podcast, I just want you to remember that that's how we see things here. So you're going to hear some of the religious talk maybe that 
you're afraid that you're going to hear if you turned into a <laughs> quote unquote Christian paranormal podcast, but just give us a try here because mm-hmm. I think you're going to find that we don't think like other people think. And as I hear this story, all it does is solidify that I'm doing the right thing. Uh, Melissa and I often joke because of the correspondence that we get here. I get, you know, I don't know, dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds at times of correspondence where people are, you know, I guess calling us, you know, every name in the book in terms of, you know, Christianity. But I guarantee you those people have never listened because even if I profess to be a Christian and will always do boldly, Mm -hmm. I'm not the Christian they're talking about because I understand that we're all in this together. And when I hear Kurt's letter, I am very, very, very wounded for him, but I'm Mm -hmm. also very wounded that I have maybe done some of these things unintentionally to people that came to me for help or people that were just in the ministries that I served in. And so it's a reminder for me to keep my head in the right place and to remember that this is about Jesus. This is not about me. And I think that's what happens with some of these Christians. And so I want to just kind of clarify up front, and maybe this will help you newcomers to understand Mm -hmm. this letter is raw. And guess what we don't do here? We don't edit letters that maybe have some profanity in them. And so this letter will contain profanity. So if you are a person who is a Christian or somebody of faith, you're going to hear some bad words today. And if you judge me for reading these bad words and even in my own voice, you know what I'm going to say to you? You're exactly who I'm talking about. If you can hear the bad words through this letter and, and not else. and not the message, not, uh-huh. <laughs> you are exactly who I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, there's a there is a famous preacher that people uh, maybe have heard of, maybe a lot of people haven't, but his name is Tony Campolo, and I'm not going to quote this verbatim, but he does this entire thing where he gives this entire speech, and then he uses the word shit in the speech. And he's telling this horrible, like, you know, story, this emotional pulling story. And then at the end, he says, but I'll bet you none of you heard what I said because I said that word Mm -hmm. and he did it on purpose. Right. And so that's the Christians that wounded this man. And I want you to hear that. And if it hurts your feelings and you want to turn this off, it's probably better for you anyway because we are not going to change what we're doing here because we're about helping people. I have said for a lot of years in my ministry, I will get in the mud with people all day long for two reasons. (laughs) Number one, because if I don't, I'm exactly who you don't need. If I'm standing on the bank saying, just swim to me and then I'll help you, you might as well drown because I'm not the kind of guy that is going to help you when you get out anyway. So I'm going to get in the mud with people. But the other reason I get in the mud with people is because I've been in that mud Mm -hmm. and I had to claw my way out and I don't ever want anybody to have to do that on their own. So we're going to, we're going to kind of approach this letter from that framework that I just explained. I love the letter because it appears to be very authentic in the way that this guy worded this. Mm -hmm. You know, we get a lot of people that will write in different things. And I, I honestly, and and if you're listening and I haven't read your letter, you know, we may still get to it. So don't take this personally, but there are some that I just don't read because I could tell that you're trying to taper things and we're not going to get very far because you're not, in a place where you're ready to, to, to just put it all out there. Yeah. So we're exactly. hearing mm-hmm. like a fraction of the story. story. And so, we you can't know, fill in the pieces if we don't have all the puzzles. Yeah. Especially the- <laughs> if you don't want to do an interview. <laughs> yeah. And so at least in an interview, we can try to get some of that out of you. So this letter is very authentic and we're going to attempt to answer a lot of this man's questions as well as get to some of the paranormal. So if you did turn in, tune in, excuse me, and you're looking for the paranormal content, trust me, this letter has that as well. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about that in length. So we're going to read this letter 
And, you know, as uh, those of you who have listened, we're going to probably pause it in between here and there and kind of give a little commentary. But definitely at the end, we're going to kind of cover it in depth. Okay. So, Melissa, you know you've arrived because this is the first letter <laughs> we've received that addressed us both. So yeah. that obviously tells us that this is a new listener. And um, he says, hey, Anthony and Melissa, my name is Kurt. And I'm writing because I'm starting to feel like I'm losing my mind. Now, I have felt that way about three times this week. <laughs> I know Christians are not supposed to say that, but yeah, I, I mean, oh, life yeah. can get crazy. crazy. And I, I feel I feel you this week more than ever, Kurt. Trust me, if you mm -hmm. knew what was going on in our lives. But let's get back to your letter. I am a very complicated guy. So I figure that it's a good thing to let you know a little bit about myself so you can understand what may be the cause of my demonic encounters. Encounters, And Kurt, I love that. Oh, I'm a very complicated guy myself because there's many sides of us if we're willing to let people see them. Mm -hmm. So when I heard that statement, I knew you were the real deal. Yeah. Because you weren't trying to present one side because we're all complicated because, mm -hmm. you know, as Martin Luther said, we're both simultaneously sinner and saint at the same time. And that's definitely a complicated thing. And many of you Christians listening that don't like Martin Luther, uh, go back and read some of his stuff. It's very good. <laughs> back to the letter. I'm 42 years old and I've been a Christian since I was 17. My family was very religious and I grew up in a strict Christian home. I'm going to be honest and say that I pretended to get saved when I was 11 and got baptized, but I didn't really mean it. I was just under the pressure of my family to be quote unquote saved. Mm -hmm. Now let's pause there a little bit. I often wonder how many people felt that way as a child and were never authentic, but there was a pressure from their family to get saved right away. I guess so maybe the parents could think that they like did their job. Did their job. Or, yeah, exactly. Because especially when he, whenever I hear the word strict, you know, um, Christian background, that's always kind of scary to me. It just seems like there's a little more, like you said, more pressure to be perfect or more pressure to, but at age 11, I mean, you're still developing, you're still learning yourself. I mean, you go to church, you read the Bible, but you have, you don't have enough life experience to say, Hey, I get all of this. Let's a absolutely. You know. And, and I think one of the best compliments I ever got is when my kids were younger and I was in full-time ministry, their friends would come over and say, you know, this isn't really a house like <laughs> the, a pastor has or a, a, that a pastor lives in, mm -hmm. because I think there was a preconceived notion that when they came to spend time with my kids, that we would be like praying 24 well, seven or no something TV on, and we no... were laughing, having a good time <laughs> no because games. although we were very much, you know, growing up in a Christian house, mm -hmm. it wasn't strict. I taught mm -hmm. my kids to think on their own. Mm -hmm. Melissa will tell you, my kids are like a pack of wolves. They're, yeah. <laughs> they're ferocious, but they have, they're independent. They are fighters. Yes. I, I, I've uh -huh. often made the comment that I can drop my kids off in a foreign country where they don't speak the language with no money. And three days later, they'll be at the yeah, front door way home. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's the way we raised them. And so I always knew then that that word strict yeah. actually pushes people away. So mm -hmm. as Kurt says that, uh, Kurt, that my, my voice got a little teary I know, mine when, too. when I was reading it because the, the pressure you felt to try to please these people and, and God bless your family. I, I, I don't mean any disrespect, but there should have been more of a pressure for them to really introduce you to Jesus in a way that you could spark up a relationship, not mm -hmm. check off a box. box. Yeah. Now he does go on to say, I did accept Jesus authentically when I was 17. With that being said, I have always had an adversarial relationship with the church. I believe in Jesus, but the church that I belong to sucks. Actually, I fucking hate it. And I'm going to pause there again. And of course, I'm sure some of you heard that and you're looking for the Spotify button to forward to the next podcast. And if, and, and if that's the case, then so be it. This probably isn't the podcast for you. 
but I see that authenticity in Kurt's letter and I understand. Kurt, I often tell a story and um, it's one that's kind of humorous, but when I was saved at 16, remember I grew up in a Catholic home where we kind of went to church sporadically, not necessarily Christmas and Easter, a little more than that, but not much more. And I went through the whole Catholic, you know, catechism, first communion, all the, the, you know, the, the, I guess, regimens that you would do. Mm -hmm. And at 16, just a chance encounter went to a, a assembly at school and some motivational speaker came and talked to us and told us, if you want to hear more, come to this church. And, uh, he was an evangelist. I didn't know what the heck that even <laughs> meant, but I got saved and I started going to this Assemblies of God Church and I still have a profound love for the Assemblies of God Church. The Pentecostals don't scare me like they do some, but that church welcomed me in very much so, Kurt, at the beginning, but then it was in the 1980s and I played in a heavy metal band and I was a raw, rough kid you know, torn bleach jeans and, uh, <laughs> concert, black concert t-shirts with the sleeves cut up and looking, you know, ragged and, and like a rocker. And they eventually started to push me to cut my hair, mm -hmm. you change know, your and change and... my appearance. And I hated that. Mm -hmm. And although they were welcoming in and of themselves, they were very much seeing me as a project. And I always hated that. And so I've always had an adversarial relationship with the church and Melissa has heard so many stories, but as a minister, we were talking about this earlier in the car today. Mm -hmm. I was always in trouble at church <laughs> because as a minister, I would push the boundaries because I didn't care about religion and I didn't care about, you know, rules. And, and, and I was often disrespectful and I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that I've repented from that. And maybe some stuff that I've not even realized yet. But on the same token, I was trying to help the lost. I wasn't trying to look perfect or whatever. And that stems from my earlier experiences with the church. So I hate it too, Kurt. And sometimes when we continue to go to church, we know that that's kind of where we're supposed to be. But the people are still people, people. right? Mm -hmm. So he goes on. Of course, my dumb ass is still a member of the same <laughs> denomination and I have put my kids through the same spiritual abuse that I suffered as a kid. Now, that part is what caught my attention. So this letter came across my desk. I mean, we have other staff members, but uh, this letter came across my desk. And I actually highlighted that because I saw that and that like broke my heart because I'm wondering, I, you know, what what happened? Like, was he a strict parent and put his kids through the same thing? Or, you know, you kind of, I think when you're growing up, if you're in a small town, especially in the South, I would say, but I'm just saying that, but you kind of, you always go to the same church that your parents went to, you know, you have the same pastor for the last 40 years. So I'm just wondering what's behind that part and like um, how old his kids are now and how they're doing. You know, I, and, and I love that perspective. And when, when he says, you know, I, 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 sub, I subjected them to the same spiritual abuse. Then he says, I guess that makes me stupid. Mm -mm. And it doesn't make you stupid. stupid yeah. And Melissa is hitting it on the head. It just makes us wonder what we do. The way I took it is that the denomination that he is in is still very much, you know, judging people, people. Mm -hmm. on appearance, on behavior, on perfection. And, you know, we're going to cover this more in the letter. So I don't want to, you know, stop and, <laughs> yeah. and do the dissertation right now. But there's a lot of churches that, you know, mean well, but it becomes spiritually abusive. You know, mm -hmm. when I when I hear somebody say, in a, let's say in a certain denomination, you can't go dancing you know, and, and I say to myself, you know, and some of you will say, isn't that old timey? No, there's still denominations that believe that nonsense. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I just sit there and I say, David, the man after God's own heart, there, there's a story in the Bible where he starts dancing like a weirdo, <laughs> like read your scriptures, like a, like a freak. 
like a maniac. And he was unashamed. Mm -hmm. Now, the religious people around him were trying to stop him, but they couldn't because his, his love for the Lord and, and, you know, I don't want to get too into the story. Please read it. Google did David dance in yeah. the Bible <laughs> and, and you'll find it. And I don't want to spoil it because I want it to shock you if you've never heard it. So how does a denomination say, well, now you can't go to dances. What that hap what happened somewhere in that church's history is, is that dancing like Elvis Presley right. and all that stuff started coming out mm -hmm. and Elvis shook a hip yep. and all the religious oh, people it. went, that's it. Our that's kids can't dance anymore. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear his letter, I hear a lot of that. His kids are sitting in yeah, a Sunday that's school. What I was thinking. Mm -hmm. They're, they're being taught, you know, uh, you better repent of your sin or you're going to go straight to hell. If you were to be sinning right now and the Lord took you, even though you've been a Christian your whole life, uh -huh. you're going to be in hell. So don't sin ever. And mm -hmm. if you do, you better drop to your knees and repent. That's abusive. It is. It's hard. And, and it's can't wrong. Develop. Yeah. Exactly. And, and people will see, some of you listening are going to say, well, here he goes with that gray stuff again. It, it's not that I'm going with the gray stuff again. I'm going with what the Bible says. If you don't believe that you also sin mm -hmm. and you're just looking at somebody and saying, well, there goes that teenage girl out to the dances at the school. I would never let my kid go. And that's why my kid is better than your kid. You're the person that Jesus cursed out in the Bible. <laughs> uh -huh. Jesus went to prostitutes and, and promiscuous women and demonically influenced people and thieves and liars and said, Hey, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. Are you hurting? I see you. Did he say, go and sin no more? Yes. But that was after he built a relationship and ministered to them. Mm -hmm. He, he wasn't that. So where do we get that? We get that from religion. Mm -hmm. We get that from some demonic scheme that tells people that you have to call out sin when you see it. And there's an arrogance to that, that believes that you've stopped sinning uh -huh. because if you really knew the depths of your sin, you don't have time to be doing that. As a matter of fact, what the Bible says is when we confess our sins to one another, well, that's only going to be done in an environment where Melissa can come and say, hey, I got this sin I'm working on. And I say, you know what? I've been there. And, you know, let's talk about that because I'm struggling with my own stuff right now. Let's just spend 30 minutes talking about this and praying. Mm -hmm. The Bible doesn't say Melissa has to find some religious guy and say, I'm sinning right now and then get beat over the head for 20 minutes about how big of a, of a sinner she really is. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I took what he said there. But I do wonder his kids are maybe are a little older cause he's 42. Maybe they're teens. Maybe they're even in their early twenties or maybe they're still young. Well, I'm thinking after he got married, cause it sounds like he's married that, they after they got married had children they just stayed at the same church and just kind of re the cycle repeated itself like one of the episodes about the familiar familial spirits sp yeah. spirits or the yeah okay so let's let's <laughs> kind of move forward here so he says i guess that makes me stupid no it just makes yeah. you somebody who wants your kids to grow up in a christian environment mm -hmm. and, and he says that i just want my kids to know jesus deep down in my soul i know that god is real and that jesus loves me what I struggle with is that I'm not perfect. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a murderer or something. I love that. Mm -hmm. I just struggle with sin, more specifically lust. Believe me when I say that I am ashamed of myself for looking at pornography. So again, I'm going to pause here and I'm going to say to you listeners who are tuning in for the first time and you're worried if we're some crazy religious, uh, as soon as we hear a sin, I'm going to, uh, hit the scratch <laughs> on the record and we're going to start condemning you. No. This gentleman must have listened for a while because he's willing to write into a podcast and in the third paragraph, just put his just stuff put out it. there. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to pat ourselves on the back, but I'm saying we're going to walk this gentleman through this. Now he says, I'm not perfect. Now, I'm going to say that many of you Christians who are listening now, what, 
what pops in your head as I'm going to talk here, you're going to say, well, I don't look at pornography. And I'm going to say, okay, well, good okay. for you. Yeah. Let me follow you around for about 30 minutes. <laughs> and see. And I'll tell you what you lust after. Mm -hmm. So when you say you're not perfect, here's the deal, Kurt. None of us are. And if you meet somebody who either represents themselves to be that or actually professes that, what I want you to do is politely excuse yourself, turn around the opposite direction and run as mm -hmm. fast as you can, because you're going to get nothing from those people, but mm -hmm. chastisement, abuse, and more importantly, as they uh, say in the prophet, uh, you know, the proverbial, you know, metaphor, get out of the way before the lightning strikes, right. because none of us are perfect. Remember in John chapter eight, we hear a story of a woman who was literally in adultery. Like they didn't know she was in adultery. They caught her in the act of adultery and they brought her to a courtyard and said, Hey, Jesus, we caught this woman in adultery. The law says we got to stone her to death. And what did Jesus say? Let he who goes without sin cast the first stone. And the religious leaders are the ones that drop their stones first, the older people, the mm -hmm. religious people, because Jesus hit them right where it counts. And so none of us are perfect. And so I appreciate that. Now, you're looking at pornography. I don't know the percentages, and I meant to look this up, but, you know, as we were saying, but listen, I have been kind of going through all kinds of craziness over the last couple of weeks, so I forgot to look up the statistics, but I know from experience and from my past that a big majority of men and a very shockingly number of women, women. view pornography. And I'm going to tell you that you this are not alone. And the fact that you're willing to put this out here mm -hmm. is amazing. There's no judgment here. I've looked at pornography in my past and you know, it can have a profound effect. Is it sin? Sure it is, but so are the 5,000 other things that we've all done today. So we're not going to categorize you in that hierarchy of sin. We're just going to talk about your struggles here. And it's just like I did do the statistics, but I won't throw the numbers out there. But like you said, you know, for men and for women, it's, it's really high because society just throws, I'm going to use the word sex or in your face. I've, this, one, this one commercial, I absolutely hate. It's a Hardy's commercial where this lady is in like these short shorts and like a showing her breast and she's eating a hamburger and the sauce is dripping down her face and she's licking her fingers. And it's like, what in the world yeah. are you doing? Like, and young kids are, sex so it's sells. just, sex sale is just thrown all in your face and they're seeing it at such a young age now. Like it's just, it's scary. And you press a button. I was at work one day and was typing in something and porno, popped up and my manager was walking behind me to give me a letter and I'm hitting escape, skip, escape, escape, delete, <laughs> delete. Like I'm not actually watching this. It's like, and I'm, I work in HR. So I typed in a word from HR and that popped up. Sure. It was just, this is before poppers. This was like 20 years ago before the pop-up blockers, you know, mm, can block sure. those and you can set the programs with technology, you know, you can block those things. So, but yes, yeah, it's, it's crazy. So yes, it's very, brave it, it's more it's, normal than it should, should be. be i'm mm -hmm. not saying it's acceptable so please christians if you're wondering if that's what i'm saying i'm not but we're not judging kurt here because you're going to find out that he's more honest than than you would care to admit so mm -hmm. we're going to continue on with the letter here's where things went south he says my wife caught me looking at porn and made an appointment for us to visit the pastor now I'm not, I'm not going to say that that was necessarily a bad decision because it obviously wounded her and it is very valuable for us to understand her perspective and to understand that she, you know, felt that they needed help. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, mm -hmm. but he said, Kurt says, I've never felt more embarrassed and ashamed in my life. He read me the riot act and told my wife that if I did not repent, that she should leave me. So Melissa, remember when we were talking earlier, what did he mean by spiritual abuse? Uh, I did not like that part at all. And and I'm going to say this out loud and, you know, 
Kurt is pretty anonymous here, so we'll probably ever know, never know who he is and who where where he even lives or anything mm-hmm. like that. But I would say this: I would love to meet that pastor. Ah, uh, yeah. Because where in the heck do you get that? Where not only not only is that not biblical, um, but more importantly, where did you learn to believe that that's helpful? Yeah, that exactly. I'm I'm I a therapist shocked. and a minister by trade. I've helped countless people and I've made mistakes. So again, if this, if this pastor simply was in a bad mood or made a mistake, let's kind of just say that that could have happened, but we're going to push that aside. I believe that this religious denomination mm-hmm. that is speaking okay. to Kurt believes that very much so. Here's a statistic that I do know because I, when I preached at a big conference once upon a time, I quoted this statistic. They do a survey and they said, what day of the year is pornography viewed in hotel rooms more than any other days in the year? And, you know, in my conference, you know, there's, you know, probably eight, 900 people in this conference. Mm-hmm. And I told him, shout it out. And so a couple guys started, you know, shouting things out. Valentine's Day, you know, and, and you know, you know, whatever they could pop in their head. <laughs> yeah. But the, the actual study revealed that more porn is viewed in hotel rooms during pastor's conferences than any other day of the year. Mm-hmm. Wow. So what that means is, is in, in my mind, a pastor's not at home. He's not on his work computer. He's not on his home computer. Nobody's watching him. And he looks at pornography on the television Mm -hmm. because he's finally found himself in a place where he's not going to get caught. Mm -hmm. And I also know of stories where the bill, when pastors have to explain their bill, the, the, (laughs) the one story I think of is the woman who did the books at a specific church called the hotel and said, you know, we're trying to delineate what, if the pastor needs to pay any portion of his trip. And then the woman at the desk said, well, it was an adult film, you know, because she was wondering if he, if he maybe watched something for research or something like that. So here's what I'm going to tell you, Kurt, here's what we're talking about here. You leave any of us alone enough in our loneliness, in our, you know, brokenness, Mm -hmm. eventually all of us may have viewed pornography And so we're all, we're all trying to fill holes in our lives. And we, we start to believe the devil's lies that Jesus can't fill those holes. Mm -hmm. And pornography is one of those that fills loneliness and despair because we use sex to cope with our emotions. Mm -hmm. I don't know if a lot of people realize that, but we use sex to cope with our emotions, just like any other drug, Mm -hmm. because sex is very euphoric. Those of you who have a little medical background will know that it stimulates the receptors in the brain, very similar to most uh, drugs. Drugs. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very effective tool in the short term. It just comes with repercussions. And Kurt felt those because he was pulled in front of a pastor. And this pastor basically told his wife, if you catch him again, you should leave him. And I don't agree with that biblically, but I don't have time to to do a sermon on that. So we're going to keep going. He says, I could be crazy. But that didn't sound right. No, it wasn't right. Can He's, I throw something in there real quick? This is just an experience that I had. Go for it. Now, this was 25 years ago. I was when I was married and I was talking to one of my coworkers. She was in her 70s and she was just um, had a situation where her husband had an affair and they had been married for like 20 years. Their kids, I think they had two kids, like teenagers. And so they went to their pastor. They were big um involved in their churches, you know, Sunday school teachers, things like that, baseball coaches, things like that. And so she said when they went to their pastor that he was very uh, understanding, very confident to them and was just like, hey, do you want to save your marriage? And they said, yes, of course, you know, I want to save my marriage. I want to forgive, you know, my husband. And he said, okay, that's the first thing. That's the first step. And that this needs to stay between the three of you you know, the husband and wife and the person that the the husband had the affair with, like not to go tell your friends or not go tell your mother-in-law or your dad or your best friend, just kind of keep that within yourself 
because it's something that you don't want other judgment or other people opinions on what they're going to say, you know, about the situation. And she said they continue to go to their church, to their, their counseling. They also seek other counseling outside of the church. But when I heard that in the letter about how the preacher, what his response was that bothered me, I was like, that is so insensitive. And that popped in my head. I haven't thought about that in like 25 years. Yeah, I'm and sorry. And go ahead. No, you're fine. And you're <laughs> right. I, and I'm glad you interjected that because that's closer to what it should have looked like. Uh-huh. Um, and so you're right on the head. And, and I love the fact that, you know, there are examples of that out there. And so you're, you contrasting that will help us get our point across today. Mm -hmm. So this is where I, I kind of start to smile and shake my head and tear up all at the same time, because mm -hmm. I can kind of see where this was going because he said, I was not happy. So the pastor and I got into a shouting match. We were kicked out of the church. This of course caused my wife and I to be at odds. She is still not happy with me. So that tells me that this was fairly recent, but let me get back to this. So him and the pastor got into a shouting match. So this pastor, and, and please hear me again, no hypocrisy. I've gotten into shouting matches with, with um, people in the congregation and I was wrong. Whether they started shouting at me first, you could see in those moments that we are making this more personal than it mm -hmm. was. But this pastor didn't like that he was told something by this guy because there was no effort to understand what Kurt was struggling with. Mm -hmm. Again, we are not saying that Kurt wasn't sinning, but what we're saying is, is this is not how you handle it. So Kurt, in a way, there's a part of me that's happy that you stood up for yourself. But wh why I say I could see this coming is because the second you didn't take this spiritual abuse, mm -hmm. this pastor has the power yep. and I've used the power over people before in ways that uh, there's definitely no way that I could ever justify horrible ways, but I was wrong. And this pastor was wrong. And Mel what Melissa said is right on the head of how this should have gone, because I think Kurt would have received that more. Mm -hmm. So now this marriage is at odds. So he says, we decided to go see a Christian counselor and this has helped me a little, but I feel like the sessions are all about how bad I am and how I need to repent. Our marriage is still not good, but I am praying that it can be healed. Now, let's let's get a little practical here. So he's at a Christian counselor. He feels this is a little better. More than likely that the counselor has more skills exactly. than yeah. pastor. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a vocational uh, minister and a licensed therapist for a lot of years, I would constantly be given a lot of the people that came to the church, even who just wanted pastoral care, because I was the, the therapist as well. And you always have to delineate between the two. But the reason that is, is because there were several times in churches that I worked at where pastors tried to be counselors <laughs> and they just weren't skilled. Their hearts mm -hmm. might've been in the right place. So Kurt is probably getting some benefit because there's some counseling skill there. Mm -hmm. But it is also a Christian counselor who is constantly at least making Kurt feel like that's what's expected of him, or it could be that that's what the counselor is saying. Mm -hmm. My suspicion is, and just this is intuition or just experience, that this is probably a male counselor mm -hmm. because females tend to be a little more empathetic, but I could be wrong. Now, when this counselor is telling him he needs to repent and how bad he is, this is where counseling gets tricky. And mm -hmm. so Melissa and I are kind of smiling because there, there has to be some honesty here. Anytime a couple goes to counseling, here's what I would tell them up front. There's a 50, 50 fault here. Mm -hmm. And oh my gosh, Melissa, women <laughs> would lose their mind or men would lose their mind. If the other person had caused the issue that brought them to counseling. You're saying he cheated on me and I'm 50% at fault. And you've heard me on the podcast. You've mm -hmm. known me for a while. I would tell them, well, yes. Now, did you cause the affair? No. What was going on in your marriage that an affair was possible? Now, 
In reality, there are times where a woman or a man is a very good spouse and the other person just has sex addictions or Mm -hmm. they're just not living the right way. They don't trust Jesus. They're manipulators. So in those instances, they're probably not sitting in therapy. Mm -hmm. But a man doesn't want to hear that he's part of the problem when he caught his wife cheating. But the question is, are you neglectful? Are you uh, abusive? Exactly. My the coworker example that I gave you and I use that cause I was having issues in my marriage and, you know, I seek out, you know, wisdom from, you know, someone, you know, that I trusted and is very honest and very open about things. And that's what she said. The, the pastor was like, Hey, well, what do you think, you know, you, what was your part of it? And she owned up. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I have never seen anything like it, the forgiveness that she gave him. And she was honest and he was honest about, you know, why he did what he did. And she said, well, you're right. You know, I'm not giving you the attention that you need. It's all about the church or it's all about the kids softball teams or it's all about these other things. Like he felt like she said he felt like he was an ATM. That was the only time that, sure. you know, that, hey, dad, I need money or, hey, the kid's going to college or, hey, we need to do a fundraiser for the softball team. So it is a 50-50 and to be open for to that and to just say, step back and look at it, that was just amazing. And I've learned a lot from that. That, that relationship has always been special to me. Well, let's let's get down to business here because I'm going to take you back to this letter and say, I, I, as a therapist and I'm not these, (laughs) your therapist, Kurt, but I can tell you this right now. I see flags because although a woman can be wounded, if she catches her man looking at porn, Mm -hmm. her instinct was to take you to the minister Mm -hmm. instead of sitting down and having a conversation with you. That tells me that she's from that religious, religious mindset, mindset as well. That's what so, I was thinking. So if your wife happens to listen to this, which I think you're alluding to the fact that you hope nobody does, but we'll get to that at the end of the letter. I can tell you that we are getting into the weeds here in terms of, you know, trying to help Kurt understand why this demonic entity came into his life and you're probably at this point wondering where's the demon even in this story. Mm -hmm. We'll get there. Now here's what he says. Now the now to the crazy part, the pastor and an elder from our church came to the house to see about allowing us to come back. These guys asked me to log into my computer and pull up my search history to verify that I'm still abstaining from pornography. And I cracked up here and, and we don't want to go down this rabbit trail, but First of all, if he's still looking at porn, he's deleting that history. Trust me. But number two, what are you, the cops? Yeah. And then like the example that I gave about my coworker, that only one member or the council at the church knew about not every, uh, not every elder yeah, at so- the church is almost like, hey, look, we know your business or hey, you know, we, you know, we're better than you. Let's all of us like go. That was insane. Well, he says, again, I was <laughs> humiliated and. These guys, these, these, this church doesn't care. Yeah, exactly. They're they're trying to humiliate Humiliate. you. Mm -hmm. And again, if somehow that pastor is, finds this, please email me. Mm -hmm. Please email me. It's an eagle trip. Because, right on the head. I would love nothing more than you and I to have this debate. I'm not rescuing Kurt, but I'm trying to help Kurt. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you that you don't know what you're doing, especially when the demon comes into this picture. But he goes on. They then decided that we could come back if we would do private counseling with the pastor. That is where I feel the demonic stuff came to be. In those sessions, I was belittled in a way that words cannot describe. And this this phrase, boom, hits me in the face. I felt so small. Mm -hmm. That has to be so hard. When I read that, my heart just like... Well, and, and swelled up for him. I mean, that was the just, pastor's point. Exactly. Like why? That's so. I would love nothing oh more gosh. to sit with this the pastor. spiritual abuse. Exactly what he said. Yeah, it is. And I would love nothing more to sit with this pastor and say, let's, let's, let's be honest. Shut the microphones off. Mm-hmm. Let's have a talk. Where's your sin in your life? Because you know what this pastor would say? I don't have I it. I don't have it. Uh-huh. And then I would say, there's your problem. 
and you need to read what he Jesus was that said pastor about, at the yeah. conference in the hotel that yeah. the secretary was yeah, looking at the exactly <laughs> trust me trust me that is way more likely than you think it is now let's get let's go on because this pot we're, we already knew we were going to go long today but we're getting crazy so i'm not somebody who normally lets a person talk to me that way so probably a man's man very much like me i get it mm -hmm. i just thought that i needed to fix this for my family so he took it after the second session I came home and cried. I just laid on the bed and cried for like an hour. I don't feel that the uh, that this was tears streaming stemming from repentance. It was tears from feeling like I was abused. It took me back to my childhood and getting shame for my behavior. So again, here's that denominational uh -huh. stuff, and we've already beat that to death. I start to I started to hear a voice telling me that I was worthless and that I would never measure up to God's standard. It told me that I should kill myself. Now, if you're a Christian and you really are one that struggles with those grace preachers like me, let me tell you this. This is the reality of being a judgmental Christian. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say something controversial, which maybe will make some of you turn this off. And hopefully it makes some of you tell your friends to listen, because mm -hmm. I'm going to say the truth right now. The devil and the demons are behind religion and they are behind pastors and religious people who treat people this way. Mm -hmm. This is part of a demonic scheme. Yep. This man was lusting. A devil found his sin and exploited it mm -hmm. and influenced it. Kurt made the decision to keep watching. You can't, you know, blame the devil for that. These were decisions Kurt made, but it began a series of events that were orchestrated by a demonic realm. And these demons were set out just waiting for the right moment to mm -hmm. enter. And this is where they entered because the religious people, instead of being the helpers, became the abusers mm -hmm. and it took him back to childhood. So poor Kurt has been dealing with this for a long time. And so if you're good, we'll love you. And if you're not, we're going to punish you. I can tell you this right now, people, if you're in any relationship and that's your truth, you now understand how Kurt feels, but somehow a religious person mm -hmm. forgets that yeah. they want to be treated with love and respect and mm -hmm. grace, but they somehow forget when it's reciprocated that, you know, there's some little disconnect where exactly. they say this person doesn't deserve it or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so when Kurt says that this is where a demon came into his life, he said it was not a voice in his head. It was outside of his body and somewhere in the room. He says, the scary thing is, is that it was my wife's voice. I was so messed up that it took me about 30 seconds to remember that my wife was not home. So he's laying in bed, crying, feeling abused. This is where demons will make their move. And this is where, you know, we start to see that this orchestrated plan has put him in this place where the demon actually represented itself to be his wife. And I'm mm -hmm. going to tell you why that is. It's because the wife was part of those feelings, feelings. those negative feelings yeah. that he was experiencing. So hearing a demonic voice may have actually snapped him back into a semblance of, of, you know, I got to clear my mind because mm -hmm. this is, this is demonic. This is his wife's voice. It, it's almost a mocking, exactly. if you will. Yeah, that's how I felt. And so when he realizes that she's not home, put yourself in his shoes, how terrifying that <laughs> is. And I don't know if this was in the middle of the day or in the evening, but this therapist and this pastor are working on this guy without grace. Yeah. It's definitely about judgment. So mm -hmm. let's continue. From there, the voice would talk to me every time I started to feel down. Listen uh, to us listeners. This is how demons work. They feed on negative emotions. Things like depression and despair are open doors for these beings mm -hmm. to start to try to tear you apart. So anytime you're feeling down, there is a demonic influence around you that's trying to get to you. And we're going to get to that in a little bit, but I want to kind of make that a bookmark because of course they're talking to him because they've been waiting for this moment mm -hmm. and this abuse was also an open door. As a matter of fact, I would say it's the door that the demons needed to, to get, get through in. to manifest. Mm -hmm. And so those of you who have suffered abuse, on top of all the horrible things that you've struggled, 
that is also one of the negatives of abuse. And it's something that starts really early because you, in the letter where he said he automatically went back to his childhood. So he said he's 42 years old, but at that moment it took him back to that when he was 11 years old that I'm guessing or somewhere around that age. And it's like, sure. like it starts early. It's like you said, it creeps in little by little. It's not just bam, here I am. Yeah. So here we, <laughs> so here we go with the plan the being, plan. The, yeah. it's working like clockwork because he said, I told my wife and she was skeptical at first. So of course the demons are going to, she ain't going to believe you dude, but it does say, she said that I was probably having a mental episode <laughs> and that I should check myself in somewhere. So imagine he's struggling. Wow. He feels abused. He was struggling with pornography to begin with, which has all kinds of loneliness and despair and things like that written all over it. Emptiness. Then he gets busted. He gets shamed. He gets abused. And the person that's supposed to love him the most doesn't even believe him and actually tells him, just go check yourself in somewhere. You see, there's no compassion on her part. On her part, yeah. And so I'm not saying she's a bad person. Yeah, I'm I don't saying, want to beat her up, so I'm going to be quiet. But I'm going to say that it's all part of that religious <laughs> Bitches, nonsense. Uh -huh. He says, the funny thing is that I didn't even consider that. I knew that it was paranormal and evil. And I love that because many times you'll be accused of that, but there's usually... When it is something that might be uh, an emotional despair or even mental illness, you'll kind of wonder. But those of us who have experienced paranormal evil stuff, mm -hmm. you know what it is. Mm -hmm. So he says this, my 12-year-old daughter was the first one to see it. We were sitting on the couch and watching a TV show. I started to do that thing in my mind where I started to feel shame for the things I have done. So he's just watching TV and the shame just kicked in that, you know what that is? Mental picture demon walked by and said, Oh, look at this beautiful family moment. Mm -hmm. Whisper in his ear. Don't remember you're a pervert or don't you remember you struggle with lust or whatever. Mm -hmm. So here he goes. He's in his mind. Please hear me. I have no doubt. Even though some of you would ask me to prove it, I couldn't. This is how demons work. It was a beautiful family moment. Yeah. Demon came by and planted a little seed and then ran you know, and, and waited for the show. Mm -hmm. And it says, I was really kicking my own ass when my daughter said, who is that standing in the doorway? When we turned to look, there was nothing there. She described a dark shadow in the shape of a tall person. So the demon is now manifesting to the daughter. That scared. That actually gave me the chills again when I first read the letter. And now that you're reading it, that gave me the chills. I feel bad. For the, for the daughter, like, is it trying to attach itself to her? Well, what you it know? is, like, is the, it's trying to it destroy the whole family. Mm -hmm. And so it's got a plan to work on the dad. The daughter's the next target. Yep. And and it's got a... She's at that age around where he was, 11, well, 12. Well, well, picture this. Uh, none of us want to hear this, but every one of us, there's demons orchestrating our demise right now. <laughs> this is just, we're hearing a story about it. You've had it in your life. You commit a series of, you know, behaviors or a series of events happen and all of a sudden your life's in shambles and very few of us go, yeah, a demon was working on that. We just say, oh, that sucked or I have bad luck, whatever. <laughs> no, this is how it works. This gentleman is just telling the story as it was happening. Yeah. So it says it wasn't long after that we saw a picture of my wife and I fly off the shelf in the living room. It didn't fall. It flew about 15 feet and shattered. As scary as the apparition and manifestations are, they are nothing compared to the torment that I experience internally. And of course, I think we could all grasp that. Mm -hmm. I just feel like I cannot escape my shame. It, it talks to me at least once a day. It tells me I will never measure up to God's standards and that I should turn from my faith. It tells me to follow my desires and to turn my back on religion. Now, I love that because the devil will put truths and lies, lies. and everything. Mm -hmm. We should all turn from religion, but not from your faith. Yeah. And I could go on there, but we definitely have to get through this letter. So it says it has gotten to the point where I'm afraid to be alone. I'm so tired and I need help. By the way, in my counseling sessions with the pastor, I brought this up. He told me, and I quote, well, what did you think was going to happen? 
You brought this evil to your family. If you would just sincerely repent, then the demons will go away. If they are still there, then you obviously have not been sincere in your repentance. And that makes me want to sin and wow. find that pastor and yes. and uh, teach him, you know, some different ways to think, but we'll leave that alone. Mm -hmm. I know that cannot be the way you approach somebody who is struggling. And it's not, Kurt. Hopefully we beat that into everybody's head so far. But that is par for the course in the denomination that I'm in. That leads me to you. I started to Google podcasts and I came across an episode where you interviewed a guy named Jay. That really got my attention. You didn't judge him or beat him down. You were kind. You seem to have a different perspective on Jesus and spiritual warfare. I also like the interview you did with Patricia. That's why I said he's a new, mm -hmm. he's a newer listener because yeah. that was the last episode of our last season. As you can tell, I have listened to all of season two. I'm starting on season one and I'm intrigued by your theology. I am sincerely hoping that you can help me. Can you please try and explain to me if I am crazy for feeling abused by the church? Also, can you pray for me to find deliverance from this demon that is trying to tear me apart? I'm not going to give my last name or requesting to be on your program because I don't want my church to somehow hear this and make our family suffer for reaching out to someone outside the church, which is their church, not mm -hmm. the capital T church. I will eagerly await your response and hope you can read this on your show so that it may not only help me, but others. And then he, he closed it in despair, mm -hmm. Kurt. Now, Melissa, before I jump into this, these notes I took here, and, <laughs> and I don't know if a lot of you realize, I, don't, I, I do an outline, and then we just kind of go off the cuff here because we're real and not contrived here. But this one I took notes, man, because there's, I, could, I could talk about this for 10 hours. Mm -hmm. So we have to be concise. But before we get to that, Melissa, what do you think? I think, um, I, I know we've got to like wrap this up, but I do feel like he, what he is being abused by the church. I feel like the spouse is kind of on the church's side of, instead of like, you know, supporting him, but I'm glad that he is acknowledging what he's struggling with and like, and, and reaching out and asking for help. I mean, I can go on and on and on, but I'm going to let you finish up with your notes and everything. I mean, this is a great letter and I'm glad that it came across and I think is, you know, it's going to help a lot of people, but I'm just curious about like, is there some childhood trauma that's making him or like, how did he, you know, get into the porn, you know, watching like porno. I had um, a cousin, I'll make this really quick, um, that his you know, all of our cousins, we all grew up together. So we're like all the same age and we still communicate. Like a lot of my friends are my relative, like my first or second, third cousins. And so he, his parents, you know, watched porno and they used to, um, you know, back in the blockbuster days, like the DVD, like the, what do you call those? The VHCs or the VHS. <laughs> DHS. Yeah. yeah. So that's how long ago it was. And so he was exposed to pornography as young as like seven or eight years old. I mean, it was just out in the open. They would like record them and give them to their friends. So they would like see that like on television. So to have that at such a young age, and it was almost like the familiar um, Spirit. spirits that you uh, referenced to and like some of the other podcasts. And that was the first thing that popped in my head. Like, you know, is it something like that? So my cousin always felt like it was something that his dad did it, his uncles did it you know, all of their friends did it. So it's just something that maybe he thought that he should do or if it's normal. And then like years, years on, you know, he got married, kind of the same thing with Kurt, went through, you know, having issues of wife, wife finding out and things like that. So he went to therapy and come to find out that that's what he was struggling with, that he just felt like being a man, that it was something that it was accepted, but you know, come to find out that it was causing more issues than helping, I guess, in a sense. Well, and, and in an effort to, you know, push us in, into the, the things that Kurt asked us to do, because again, we can, yeah, I could, we can do I could 45 to, podcasts on that. Uh -huh. But what I want to say is this, the first thing Christians do that make a mistake is they focus on the behavior 
And that's where we go wrong. It isn't about pornography. Mm -hmm. It's about what's underneath. Like I said, you want to get to the root of a lot of sexual crimes. Find out why people are using sex to cope. Because what you'll realize is, is we all do that. It's euphoric. It's a drug. Then you go deeper and say, what are they coping from? Mm -hmm. Same thing with alcohol. Same thing with drugs. What is the underlying issues? And that's where judgmental Christians drive me crazy because they don't want to get in the mud. Mm -hmm. They want to tell you to stop doing it so they can go on their day and go tell their friends, I had a sinner come to me today and I taught him about about Jesus. Jesus. Uh And it's like, you didn't teach him about nothing. You pushed him away from Jesus because you're not willing to get in the mud. So it is things like loneliness, despair. You want to ask what pornography is about? It's about an emptiness. And if there's an emptiness, we're going to try to fill it. Pornography is such a powerful drug, quote unquote, that it will serve its purpose. Mm -hmm. See, when somebody's coping, that's a good temporary help sometimes. But what, where we struggle is we don't go on to deal with the problem. The coping mechanism is so good. You forget to go fix what was broken. Mm -hmm. And then what that does is it causes more problems, which needs more coping. And now you're in a cycle where you're not dealing with your issues. Where's the emptiness? I'm going to tell you, Kurt, and Mm -hmm. and please forgive me if, if you feel that I'm attacking your wife, but there's an emptiness in your marriage, whether you cause that, she caused that or both. There's an emptiness in your religion and you know it. But what I love about you, Kurt, is that you love Jesus Mm -hmm. and and, and, and please hear me, Christians, if you say, well, he should have just turned to Jesus. Well, so should have you. Mm-hmm. The 40 times you sinned today, you should have turned to Jesus as well. It's a human condition that we struggle with. And Kurt, so we're in the mud with you right now. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Christians, you've messed this up because you don't know the truth of the gospel. And again, you know, like I told Melissa before, I want you to go because I'm going to jump on the, the <laughs> preacher's soapbox here. I'm at the pulpit now. You do not know the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel is this. You do not understand the law. And right now, I hope I just literally ticked off so many listeners who are saying, you're one of those grace preachers that doesn't understand the law. And you just told me, I don't understand the law. You don't understand the law. (laughs) Let me tell you this. I know I respect the law because I understand that I can't meet the expectations of the law. You legalists think you can. The law can't do, it can't help you get to the very thing it demands of you. Let me say that again. The law cannot help you meet the very demands that it tells you. See, you legalists, you forget what Jesus said in the Beatitudes. In Matthew chapter 5, This Jesus, this dude says, oh, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery because he's hearing these preachers, these religious leaders in the synagogue saying, you're an adulterer, you're an adulterer. Remember, they brought the adulteress to be stoned. And he's saying, if you've looked at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. Mm-hmm. that's the law spoken from the very lawgiver. The word became flesh. The very word of God said, that's the law, not the written law. That's the law. Speaking the law said you've committed adultery in your heart. If you truly believe that there would be no judgment of the Kurtz of the world because you'd go, he's just not meeting the law in that area. Just like I can't meet it in this area. Let's get together and help each other. When you understand that the law was given as a mirror to look yourself in the face and go, I can't meet these. I'm not going to heaven. Mm. If Jesus says you have to fulfill the whole law. Remember, James said, if you've fulfilled the whole law, but you've committed just one act against the law, you've broken the whole law. Think about that. That's what the law really says. So you legalists, you haven't found the hopelessness of that yet. You think somehow that you can keep working harder and harder and harder, and you're going to get there. Well, you're not. When I understood that I'm up on that pulpit preaching, you know, stop sinning, stop doing this, stop doing that. 
But then I know the 20 sins I committed that week. And half the time I was preaching to myself, I think. But, <laughs> but what happens is, as you understand, I'm hopeless. There has to be something I could do. Some religions pray five times a day. Some religions make you put altars in your living room so you could constantly be in repentance. Mm -hmm. God said, I already did it. I sent my mm -hmm. son. He died for you. That's grace. Unmerited favor. You don't deserve it, but you get it. Mm -hmm. So when you respect the law and you understand the law, then you understand what Jesus said that I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. And how you get to heaven is that you accept Jesus and then God sees you as perfect. The devil is the one that says, now nah, you're a sinner. Now that, that podcast right there is ridiculous. Those grace preachers are ridiculous. No, it has to be that way. You have to understand that we are all broken. Kurt, the reason that these religious people were used by the devil to get to you is because they were open mm -hmm. to that judgmentalism. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you did, man. I, yeah. I, cr I cross my heart. I don't care what you did. And anybody who's listening that does, please hear me. Please really answer this question. If God gave me the insight to download your entire life into my brain <laughs> and scan through it, oh, it wouldn't wow. take me 30 seconds to find what you struggle with. Uh-huh. Uh, one of my uh, yep. favorite preachers that I quote often here is a man named Tully and Chavigian. He often says, you know, things about this very topic. And one of the things he said is we all are in recovery, mm -hmm. like an addict from something. Mm -hmm. And that's why, Kurt, I hope that you reached out to us because that's all we are here. If you had a list of mine, you'd go and this guy's talking to me. But then you'd say, wait a minute, that's the perfect person to talk to me mm -hmm. because he knows his own stuff. Trust me, dude. I know my own stuff. That's the difference between the old me and the new me. There's no judgment in me because I know, you know, you could turn around and help me as soon as I helped you if we're doing this right. Mm -hmm. Now, let me continue here. Sin is not categorized. That's a human concept. That's a religious concept. Remember, the devil in the garden came and said, you're living this bliss, but God is keeping this stuff from you. Eat this fruit here and you'll be like him seeing good and evil. Well, what that did is it opened up sin because that part of Eve and, and, uh, and you know, subsequent Adam, they became these people that wanted to know more. But what they what they were exposed to at that moment was the law mm -hmm. that you now are not dependent on God like you were just a few seconds ago. You're now open to seeing the things that you can do, the things that you shouldn't do, but you can. And it opened mm -hmm. this whole bag of worms. And every one of us mm -hmm. is a slave to that, that mindset. We are born of sin. And, you know, we don't want to get into original sin because I'll tick a whole bunch of people off. <laughs> so if you really understood sin, you know, all these people in, in, in Kurt's life, if you ever listen to this, it's because you don't understand your own sin. And that's why you're so harsh. We have to all understand that we're all struggling with something. And if you don't, that sin is called self-righteousness. So if you don't know what sin you struggle with, <laughs> I just told it to you. And again, go back and read your scriptures. That's who Jesus chewed out. Now, What's the answer, Kurt? This is, let's get practical here. Grace is the answer. And, and, and I'm going to, it's going to sound too simple, especially to the listeners, maybe hopefully not to Kurt. Grace is the answer. These lies you're being told about how bad you are. Mm -hmm. That's from the devil. devil. Yep. When you accepted Jesus at 17, your sins were forgiven past, present, and future. Well, but those were just up until, no, shut up. No, yeah. All sins were forgiven in the past. Jesus died 2000 years ago on the cross, not yesterday. So all your sins, once you accepted Jesus were forgiven. So you think about your sin a whole lot more than God does. God says crazy things like as far as the East is from the West, that's where I've taken your sins. Now in a true 
you know, kind of math equation, east and west never meet <laughs> into, in, into infinity in either direction. Mm -hmm. That's how far he's removed you from your sins. Who brings you back to him? The enemy preying on that shame in you. Mm -hmm. The shame is your part. The enemy reminds you, and then God is screaming to you. Mm -hmm. That's not, I don't see you that way anymore. When I look at you, I see my son. I like that. That's good. And that's the truth of the scriptures. Yeah. Now, when the enemy lies, what he's telling you is that you're in control of your future, mm -hmm. not God. That if you would just behave better, and again, if you truly understood the law, you'd know, well, you're, you're doomed. <laughs> you're screwed, to use another term that Christians don't like me using. You're screwed. Okay? Now, I want you to think of this, and, and I want you to put this vision in your mind, because this is what popped in my mind. There's an inspired book by the Apostle John. So the, the apostle that Jesus loved, the writer of the Gospel of John, has been exiled to the island of Patmos. All of the other disciples have been brutally murdered. A lot of people don't realize this. They tried to kill John more than once, hmm. and he couldn't die. Then there's some scriptures, boy, you want to go down a rabbit hole. You know, Jesus basically kind of alludes to if you really want to be a conspiracy theorist that John couldn't die, but who knows how that worked. But he's on the island of Patmos and he is inspired to write the book of Revelation. And here's what he says in Revelation 1.9. And I'm going to read this in three different translations. He said, I, John, am a believer like you. I am a friend who suffers like you. That's the English standard version. In the King James, he said, I, John, who am also a brother and companion in tribulation. Now I'm going to read the NIV. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering. Religious people, please hear my heart through my frustration in you. Shut your mouth. This was the Apostle John. Mm -hmm. This was the guy who walked with Jesus. This is one of the sons of thunder. This is one of the uh, disciples who actually wrote that he was at the tomb when they realized that Jesus had ribbon, risen from the dead. Mm -hmm. You are not more aware of who Jesus is than John. And John addresses these people by saying, I am a struggler just like you. You see, Kurt, that's a real Christian. I don't know what denomination you're in, and I'm glad you didn't mention it. That way I don't feel like I'm attacking somebody, <laughs> nor can somebody tell me I'm attacking them because yeah, I don't know exactly. who you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I may have some suspicions, but I honestly don't know. But what I will say is this, my friend. They don't know more than John. And here's what John says. John says that he is a struggler just like you. Do you know what that means? That John knew that he was a sinner. Mm -hmm. Saved by grace, of course, but a sinner nonetheless. And so what I thought I would do is kind of just remind you that these people who are helping you, my friend, are not your companions in suffering. Mm -hmm. They are the Pharisees of old in new clothes and new appearance, but they are the Pharisees of old. Remember, these Pharisees were sinning left and right, making up lies about Jesus because they believed that it was their job to kill him. They were lying and deceiving. These were the religious people. This is the same game mm -hmm. in 2024. And here's what I know. These self-appointed gods are not here to do anything but to show you your faults and pretending to be without their own. Now, People that are listening, I'm going to give you some examples. And I literally wrote these down, which I never do, but I wanted to nail this. What if a Christian did something like this? What if they said, hey there, I see you struggling today and I'm a Christian. And I've not only suffered from a ton of stuff myself, but I actually still struggle. I'm, it may not be any of my business, but I've seen that look on your face. And I know that there were times when I was struggling and I saw that look on my face and nobody reached out. I'll walk away from you right now if you want me to. But because God has taught me to do life with people, 
I just thought I would ask. I can promise you I'm not here to judge anyone because trust me, if anyone deserves judgment, it's me. I just want to see if you needed anybody to talk to or if you needed some help. I'm still a work in progress, but God has delivered me out of some deep stuff. And I may have some insight that can help you. If not, I'm just here to listen. Mm -hmm. Now, what if you heard that? Now contrast this, because instead, here's what we get from Christians. Not all Christians, but the religious ones. We hear this. Hey there, I know you're struggling, and I'm here to tell you about Jesus. He can forgive you from whatever your sin is and whatever you've committed that, that puts yourself in this place. Now, you can kind of hear where I'm going with this, but <laughs> yeah. I have studied the Bible for many years and I have learned to live a clean life and it has benefited me. Let me try to talk to you about what I've done to get out of your situation. I hope some of you new listeners have stuck around to this point because I will guarantee you that you don't like Christians because of that second example. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say it and I'll say it again. And any pastors who want to write me, go ahead. I'll put you on this podcast. That's how confident I am that we can debate this and I'm not scared. That's why people don't like religion because that's not Jesus. Mm -hmm. That what that second example said is I got this figured out. So be like me. Mm -hmm. No clean. <laughs> you first of all, you're not clean. Second of all, you're not Jesus. And third of all, you don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. The first one is how the apostle John would have approached. The second one is how religion would approach. Now, as you hear the judgment in the second, you know, you can, you can understand that if we approach somebody who is struggling with compassion and love and understanding, mm -hmm. I, I mean, just ask yourself in your que a question, if you were struggling, which one of those two would you want to approach you? Uh, you know the answer to that. You already know. But this is the demons in your life telling you it's your fault. Mm -hmm. You're horrible. You're a sinner. Why would anybody love you? Why would your wife stay with you? She shouldn't stay with you because you're a sinner. Nobody is your bigger critic than the devil. I'm going to tell you something that maybe some of you have never studied. The word asatan means the accuser. And if you don't believe this, read, read the book of Job. The devil's job, Satan's job is to go to heaven's court and condemn you. Like the prosecuting attorney. Mm -hmm. Remember in Job where he says, hey, uh, what have you been doing, Satan? Oh, I've been going from the earth to and fro, seeing who's doing what. Well, have mm -hmm. you considered my servant Job? So there's the judge going, what about Job? Did you bring any accusations? And the only accusations he had were, well, he's doing good, but it's because you have a protection around him. Let that protection go. Let me torture him a little and then I'll find something that I can bring back to condemn him for. See, that's Asatan, the, the accuser. That's his job. And when the Bible says that Jesus died and rose from the dead and was seated at the right hand of the Father, that's because on the right hand of the judge is where the defense attorney sits. Mm. And when God says, what about Melissa? And Jesus said, well, she has done all these things, but I've already paid the price for those. Mm -hmm. So her sin debt is paid in full. So the accuser is right, mm -hmm. but we don't see her that way anymore. And if you want to go even deeper, I don't even know if you get that far. Mm -hmm. When God sees you, you're not even on trial anymore. But that's, you know, again, we can get into too deep of theology. Kurt, I'm, I want you to hear that because everything else besides that is a lie. Now, I found a quote from a guy named Ronald Rollheiser in a book called The Holy Longing. And man, like Christians, please hear this. To be connected with the church is to be connected with scoundrels, warmongers, fakes, child molesters, murderers, adulterers, and hypocrites of every description. It also, at the same time, identifies you with saints and the finest persons of heroic soul of heroic soul within every time, country, race, and gender. To be a member of the church is to carry a mantle of both the worst sin and the finest heroism of the soul because the church always looks exactly as it looked at the original crucifixion. 
God hung amongst thieves. Mm -hmm. And remember those two thieves mocking God from the cross. And then all of a sudden, one of them gets it. Mm -hmm. And he says, hey, man, just remember me in your kingdom. (laughs) The first convert never tithed. Yep. D- d- up to the end of his life was being punished for what he did wrong, was a scoundrel, was a thief, was a murderer. Who knows? We only know pieces. Some people think they know his name. Some people don't uh, believe that, but whatever. We know a lot more than what the Bible tells us, at least through other writings. But he was a scoundrel. And yet Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And so he wasn't perfect. He didn't come to Jesus perfect. He came repentant and with his open heart. That's all Jesus wanted. Jesus transformed him then. Now, some of these religious people would say, yeah, but if that thief would have been able to climb off that cross, he would have probably went and sinned and started stealing again and then lost his salvation. That's garbage. Mm -hmm. You don't sin away your salvation because you you didn't perform your way into salvation. It was a free gift and it can only be taken if you renounce it. Now, let's get crazy. Let's talk about some of this demonic stuff here because that's really what we're going to do here today. Now, this judgment is the devil speaking through people, Kurt. And it breaks my heart because I've heard the voices. And I've done things that probably deserve the voices, that the voices were talking to me telling me the earthly truth of my behavior. And I would hope you Christians can understand what I'm saying here. You don't have the, the, what what do I want to say? You don't have the market cornered in terms of forgiveness. You just think that you were transformed into this perfect being. That's not what the transformation is. The transformation is, is to a forgiven being. And when you understand how truly forgiven you are and what you were forgiven from, then you don't want to sin anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not about performance. It's about gratitude. And so Kurt, my question to you is, you said you love Jesus. Do you truly believe you're forgiven? And my honest answer to you is I don't think you do. I think part of you in your heart kind of knows that you've heard Mm -hmm. some scriptures, but you have too many voices, man, telling you something different. Mm -hmm. And those are lies. Now, I don't know what's going to happen in your future, my friend, but I do know what we're going to do here today and that we're going to pray for you. And what we are going to do is we're going to help you to try to understand that forgiveness. And when that happens, you're not going to have to worry about the pornography. I don't think anybody in their right mind, including you and especially you, believe that you should keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And I'll bet you, you haven't done it. And not because you didn't want to or the urges weren't there. You just have so much scrutiny on you, but that's not the way you get over pornography. It's just different now. I'm sure he views it differently now. You get over pornography when you realize that that hole that was there before Mm -hmm. is already filled. And that's what we're going to work on today. So here's what I want to do. This, you signed your letter in despair. There's a spirit of despair on your life. There's a spirit of emptiness in your life. There's a spirit of depression, a spirit of lust. Now, we're not going to get too, you know, too theological there, but there's a lot of demons that are working on you and they're coming for your family, not just for you. They, because destroying a family makes them... (laughs) Not only effective, it makes them happy in whatever demonic way that they can be happy. So we've spent a lot of time. We could go on and on and on. But I think at this point, we need to pray. And I also want to call out to anybody else who has not only struggled with pornography or some other sin that they have kind of become ashamed of, maybe they were exposed of. We're going to pray for you, but we're also going to pray for probably most of all people who have suffered spiritual abuse Mm -hmm. because you want to put a demon on somebody, let a Christian judge you and open that door. And that will open the door to many other Mm -hmm. things. And so because we can go on and on forever, we're going to shut up and just take this to the throne. And if you're listening 
just pray with us. Open your heart to this. If you're new to this Christian Christianity thing and some of this intrigues you, just just open your heart to what we're going to say here. And if you feel it, pray it with us. God, my heart breaks so much when I hear this because I have suffered spiritual abuse and my heart breaks even more because I've administered spiritual abuse to people. I'm not proud of it. Um, and I'm also learning to not be ashamed of it, but it's true and it's real. And those of us who have suffered spiritual abuse, whether the people were well-intended or not, it just hurts, man. And so God, what I want to do is give you the ability to, you know, through this media speak, I'm nobody. I just ramble on and on and Melissa and I laugh Mm -hmm. and tell stories, God, but Mm -hmm. You know, I just want to open up the airwaves to you, not because you don't have permission, but we just want to open our hearts to receive it is what I'm saying. So God, right now, just everybody listening has something. And I just pray that you begin to minister them to them through the Holy Spirit. God, let their body start to feel it physically. So many times when people ask us, how do you know if God's real? And I'm like, if you could just feel what I feel, it's more real than anything you can see. God, let some people begin to feel that. God, for anybody who's been abused by religious Christians or judgmental Christians, God, please reveal to yourself who you really are. You are a loving God. You are a compassionate God. All you want for us is to be in communion with you. And so God, begin to heal wounds right now. Begin to heal hearts right now. Begin to become the God in their minds that you really are and not the lies they've been told. God, make yourself tangible and real. And devil and your demons, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. You are a liar. You are a manipulator. From the very beginning in the garden, you lied to us that God wasn't enough, but he is because you're jealous, because you sinned the same way. You couldn't just see that you had everything you needed in this loving God who loved you back. You instead chose to go out on your own. And instead of repenting, you just perpetuated that to us. And we bought into it and we sinned and we brought this into the world. But you are now rebuked in Kurt's life and in the life of anybody who's listening. Those lies are no longer relevant or tangible because we understand that the love of God and the grace of God covers all sin. We rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You're not welcome here. You're not welcome in Kurt's life. And Kurt and anybody listening, I want you to just feel in your heart that you believe this. And more importantly, I want you to begin to recite this. Demon, I rebuke you. You are not welcome in my life. I believed your lies, but I don't believe them anymore. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. He is my salvation and my rock. He has forgiven me. I profess that openly. And I renounce any permissions that I've given or that people have given through their abuse on me. I renounce them in the name of Jesus. You are not welcome in my life. I give myself, I give my marriage, I give all of my relationships to you, Jesus. Please care for me as only a loving God can. Not only forgive me for my sins, but make me a new creation. Please protect me from evil. I put my life in your hands. And I pray in your name, Jesus, that today would be a new start in my life. I love you. I trust you. And I believe that although I've been wounded by Christians, that you have been misrepresented and you love me more than I've ever known and more than I ever will know. Thank you, Jesus, for changing my life. And I pray in your name. Amen. Amen. 
If you heard that prayer and you said that prayer, please reach out to us. I want to hear it. Melissa wants mm-hmm. to hear it. We love to read those letters more than anything. Yeah. And we want to let you know that you have a place that you can tell your story. Kurt, we could have spent so much more time on this paranormal stuff, and I'm going to kind of conclude with that a little bit. But I just felt in my heart that this is more about the spiritual abuse. The demons are going to go. It's mm-hmm. terrifying, yeah. and we know that. But these are parlor tricks, my friend. They're parlor tricks to get you to continue to drop your guard so that they can gain further and further permission into your life. And we're going to stop that today. Mm -hmm. And if you're struggling and you're not sure, go back and rewind this and pray the prayer again. Mm -hmm. Absorb it. You're forgiven, my friend. Should you continue sinning? Of course not. But I believe that the more you understand God's grace, the more that these things become less effective. And I'm going to give you a practical thing. If you do look at pornography again, while you're looking at it, say this phrase, I am the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Say it while you're watching it. Mm -hmm. Because it will lose its sting. Trust me. If you're somebody who struggles with drugs, Mm -hmm. if you're shooting heroin, As you're shooting it, say, I'm the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ, Mm -hmm. because that's the truth. And the more that the truth enters your life, as the Bible says, the more it will set you free. Most people think that the truth that they're talking about in scriptures is the truth that you're a dirty sinner (laughs) and that you better repent, Mm -hmm. that you better understand the law and you better follow it to a T. That's not the truth. The truth is, of course, we're all broken. But the truth that sets you free is that Jesus has forgiven you. Just accept it. Terrifying paranormal encounters, Kurt. I want you to reach out to us again and let us know if this helped. Because what I want to do further, and I don't want to expose where you're from and such, is try to guide you to maybe some different help. Mm -hmm. And maybe a different help would help you not only heal from this, but to heal your marriage as well. It's going to be very complicated because your wife seems enmeshed in this religion. And so that's why it's beyond this podcast. So please reach out to us. Melissa and I will read through that and we'll correspond with you back and forth. Um, For those of you new listeners, again, the paranormal part of this is important and we're going to continue to go through these letters, but this letter I think is a good start to season three because it Mm -hmm. just gives us a foundation of how these demons work. They'll lie to you any way they can. They'll expose your truths in the most embarrassing moments to just to take you further and further into despair. Mm -hmm. But today we renounce that despair in Kurt and others and even in ourselves, you know, (laughs) Mm -hmm. with what we're going through, the devil's kind of punching us in the gut a little bit right now, but it just reminds us too, that it's all games. Mm -hmm. Um, We're loved. We're forgiven. We're, we're definitely guided if we just choose to find the path that God's illuminated. Mm -hmm. So thanks so much for joining us on this episode, Melissa, as any closing comments or things that you feel that Kurt or the listeners need to know. Yes, just, you know, learn to like, I would go back and like what Anthony said to go back and rewind and just say that prayer and just you know, maybe a few times and like, you'll just start to, I think, love yourself again. I think I kind of struggled through my struggles is learning how to forgive myself for (laughs) things that other people have done to me or to forgive myself for things that I've done to other people. You know, the shame and the embarrassment that I, you know, put on myself and other people. And it's okay to just let it go and to just, you know, learn to love yourself again and just learn to love you know, enjoy life again. He'll make it through the struggle and he'll come out on top. It's going to be hard, but yeah. of course he will. And yeah. as a pastor who's fallen from grace and many people who fall from grace from a mm-hmm. pastoral place, you know, the world thinks we should never even speak of God again, that we should yeah, go climb exactly. in a hole. Mm-mm. Kurt, trust me, no. dude, I'm with you. I've mm-hmm. blown it. I've been shamed and embarrassed, all that stuff. It, it, there's, there's the other side of it, man. And you're yeah, going to get through exactly. this. Just, just reach out to us. And listeners, we just want to remind you, 
We're on all the socials. You can find us at the Freedom from the Struggle podcast, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Uh, some of it's under Anthony Corelli and some of it's under Freedom from the Struggle. But just do some searching and you'll find it. We don't want to spend too much time on that. Remember the Patreon account that we have or the Patreon campaign. For the $5 level, we've decided to do something kind of in addition. So at the $5 level, you not only get access to the two bonus episodes every uh, month, mm -hmm. but we also have decided to add all three of the books in the struggle series that oh, I've yeah. written. They are all on there in their entirety. Mm -hmm. So you can listen to them in full, including the return that isn't even released yet in book form. Mm -hmm. And books one and two are in the process of playing on our other podcast called the Struggle Series Podcast. So if you want to listen to them in that format, or if you're not a subscriber to Patreon, just jump over to that podcast and you can start all the way through book one and halfway through book two. And every uh, week on Thursday nights is a new chapter and you'll get through those stories and you will find that there's a crazy rebel exorcist deliverance minister who goes out to help people and he hates religion too. So you'll love those stories, I believe. And um, if you're somebody who's struggling, and this is who I really wanted to touch before we left tonight. If you're somebody who's struggling, please reach out to us. We're not here to judge you. We want to hear your story. If it's a crazy paranormal story, we want to hear that. If you're just struggling spiritually, we want to hear that as well, because those things are always tied together exactly. for sure. Yep. You can find us at uh, any of the socials. You could DM us if you'd like, or you can go to Anthony at the struggle series .com, and you can just send us a letter like Kurt did. If you want to be interviewed, just put that in the letter. We can talk about reaching out to you and setting up a time to do that. So Anthony at the struggle series dot com or just send us a DM on any of the socials and we will reach back out to you. Please hear me. We read every single correspondence that comes through. We have a team that goes through those. And so you will always be responded back to if that's what you want, it, whether we do an interview with you or put you on the program at all. So as we close, I just want to give one more shout out and thanks to our new uh, music producer, a <laughs> gentleman oh, named yeah. Todd Kazinka at Todd K voiceovers gave us our amazing intro and outro that we're about ready to play in just a second. We love it. It was so easy to work with. So if you're somebody who's looking for some voiceover work or some music work, please, please, please find Todd. You can find him on Fiverr. That's mm -hmm. the easiest place to get to him. It's very inexpensive. And about two days, this guy and I worked Great. this music yeah. out and we love it. Mm -hmm. So thanks again for listening. We hope to see you next week here on the yes. Freedom from the Struggle podcast, where we have some amazing stuff coming up this uh, season. This episode uh, was just one in the beginning of season three. So we hope to see you very soon. Thanks for listening and may God bless you and bring you peace. Mm -hmm. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Freedom from the Struggle podcast. Make sure to subscribe, tell your friends, and we will see you next time. <laughs>